For Krimo Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today are ANC veterans Mark Maharaj and Paula Jordan, here to unpack their co authored book titled Breakthrough The Struggles and Secret Talks That Brought Apartheid South Africa to the Negotiating Table. It is an honor to talk to two South Africans who played such an influential and leading role in overthrowing the apartheid regime. Mr. Maharaj and Mr. Jordan, you have now written a detailed account of the breakthrough years from 1984 to 1990 that led to South Africa's negotiated settlement. Now, Mr. Maharaj, perhaps you can tell us what inspired you to take the time to write up this history. Firstly, the accounts of how South Africa reached the negotiating table have not been, has not been told. And to the extent that it has been told, it has been based on individuals' memories and they don't deal properly with the issue. The second thing was that as we were doing our other work, we came across information that made us aware that what takes place before the parties reach the table is quite a critical moment. And therefore, ours would be a very important case study. And we have researched it sufficient, we think, to find the information showing how different sides of the forces at play were reacting and acting in that situation. So that became a very important part. And thirdly, we felt that the, the criticism that the young generation does not understand where we come from is not a fault of the young generation. It's more a fault of our generation that we haven't told the story objectively and with the facts on the table. So that's what inspired us. And we hope that it will contribute to discussion, debate, and help our people to understand where we come from, because the past always shapes the present, and what we do today will shape the future. And Mr. Jordan, what in your view were the main factors that forced the apartheid regime to the negotiation table? Well, I think as we tried to explain in our book, there was a whole range of forces that the liberation movement was able to mobilize both nationally and internationally. Uh, after the repression following the Erebonia trial, uh, one can say effectively the liberation movement had in large measure been dismantled. Its networks inside the country had been compromised. Many of its leaders had been imprisoned and uh, there was something of an ice age that was imposed on South Africa artificially uh, during that period. But during that same time, the liberation movement was able to reorganize itself, reestablish its networks, painstakingly done, and at the same time, mobilize international opinion such that by the mid 80s, the apartheid regime was internationally isolated. By the time you reach 1988-89, it is so isolated that even one of its most reliable allies, Dame Margaret Thatcher, is compelled to concede that sanctions are necessary. So it was the convergence of all these forces around the late 80s that then we arrive at a moment when the African National Congress uh, emerges as a the dominant leading force in the liberation struggle. And it has a strategy about how to move from situation of conflict into the resolution of that conflict. And it is those forces that compel the regime in the end then to concede. Uh, when you talk about, for instance, um, the transition from where we were, let's say, in the mid 80s to 1990, what tends to happen is that there's this explanation of the South African miracle. Uh, that's the red ship that you had around the transition. And what we try to make clear in the book is that this was not a miracle. Uh, it was painstaking work, very costly at uh, every sort of level for the forces of national liberation. People were killed, people were in prison, people were hanged, all sorts of terrible things happened. There were hit squads sent into the neighboring countries. The region was destabilized. All these things were very costly. It wasn't a miracle, but it was by painstaking work that the liberation movement was able to create the circumstances which compelled the regime in the end to 
see that the only way out was to go to the negotiating table. And in the 1980s, the country was on fire. The Val Triangle erupted. The UDF led a boycott of the apartheid regime. MK attacks were increasing. Now, Mr. Maharaj, how did a negotiated settlement emerge from such a turbulent context? As Palo has explained, it was the convergence of these forces that brought about conditions where the apartheid regime, which had said from 1948, that it will never talk to the African National Congress. It will never talk to any representative organ, organization of the oppressed people. But those conditions compelled it. And I think besides the painstaking work, one of the things that we have to take into account, which comes out in the book, is that between 1964 with the Rivonia trial and 1973, it appeared as if the regime's repression had successfully snuffled the capacity of our people to resist and show their protest and disagreement. It was the strikes of 1973 and the Soweto uprisings of 1976 that really showed that despite the repression, the condition of the people was such that they were prepared to stand up even in the face of that repression. That really changed the landscape. So what, what you are seeing in 1985 is that the uprisings have become almost a constant feature despite the state of emergency, that the state is trying its best to stifle it and yet from one pocket to the other, the uprisings of people is spreading and continuing. And it is that feature of the people that is critical in any transition. And I would say, that the point made by Paolo about the painstaking work remains true about even the construction phase, that it needs the people to be involved and that it is painstaking work to change society from what we have inherited during the time of colonialism and apartheid. And Mr. Jordan, according to your research, prison records shows that between 1985 and 1989, Kutia and Mandela met at least 15 times. So what was discussed at those meetings? Well, we tried to explain in the book what was discussed at those meetings. We don't have a blow-by-blow account of what happened. But I think we tried to convey uh, what the essence of those discussions was. And uh, I would say basically uh, what was happening was that uh, a point had been reached where it was possible uh, for Mandela to write a letter to Gwota, uh, a gap that Gwota himself had in fact created in that notorious uh, speech of his, uh, and say to him, all right, uh, let's talk about this issue. Uh, where Guerta linked the issue of the release of political prisoners to an end to the apartheid regime. And that was the gap that Mandela then took. And that, I think, was what created the opportunity for discussions. At the same time, too, I think we explained that there were feelers being sent to the ANC uh, by the regime through a number of channels, indicating that there was perhaps the possibility of some discussion. Now, of course, from the very beginning, when MK was set up in 1961, what the ANC had said was that if the regime in earnest wants to talk about the dismantlement of the apartheid regime, we are willing to talk. We're not willing to talk about moving the furniture around moving the debt chairs on the Titanic around, what we're prepared to talk about is about the dismantling of apartheid. So when those sorts of opportunities then presented themselves, because we hadn't painted ourselves to a tactical corner, we'll never talk. We said, all right, fine. If you're prepared to talk in earnest about the end of apartheid, then these possibilities exist. And that is what I think the discussions between Kobe Kutsia and Mandela were about was establishing, are you in earnest about ending apartheid? That was also the content of the discussions taking place 
through those other feelers as well externally are you in earnest about talking about dismantling apartheid and mr maharaj in the mid 1980s the anc had contact with members of the african ruling elite so what was the impact of those meetings we were engaged in an exercise that had two elements we needed to find a way to keep mobilizing no matter how few within the white community the second thing was to try and whittle away the support within the white community by of the apartheid regime so we engaged with them to show them that the only way to a future for all including the white community was the liberation of all our people and we followed the idea that was then coined by archbishop tutu later on to say that our freedom involves not just the liberation of the oppressed but involves also the liberation of the oppressor from the trap and poison of racism so we were engaged in that exercise and feeling out what was the real thinking of the apartheid regime was it as paulo says prepared to see that the way forward involved engagement with the anc in an in earnest about a change and to that end those discussions helped us to map out a pathway which was steered by president tambo under his leadership the constitutional committee first of all put a set of constitutional guidelines for everybody to discuss both within south africa and abroad to say this is the type of guideline that should guide our discussion as to what kind of south africa we need in the future the second thing that he did was to steer the adoption of what came to be known as the harare declaration which got the support and was endorsed by both the OAU the Organization of African Unity and the United Nations General Assembly and that became the road map of the way forward but it was informed by an understanding not only of the forces for liberation and the solidarity movement around the world but it was also based on an understanding of the position that the apartheid regime found itself in and therefore was able to put out that as a road marker to say the discussions have to be about producing a democracy based on one person one vote that is the bedrock of the change and if we look at the letter that mandela had drafted for the pw vota you will see there that he says the principle that has to underline the discussions is the principle of majority rule and in adding to that please give us your view mr jordan i think that was a very important breakthrough that we made because what we discovered to our amazement in those discussions was an alarming level of ignorance about a the national liberation struggle b the anc itself and c what the policies and uh, the ideas of the ANC were the levels of ignorance were a, a result first of censorship uh, in that uh, you know news about the ANC was very strictly controlled you know and marshaled by the regime through repressive laws etc etc uh, the second cause of course was uh, the isolation intellectually and otherwise of the african community also a uh, outcome produced by the apartheid uh, regime and uh, its policies and what one was able to do in those discussions a was to break through all, all those levels of ignorance i think uh, some of them were quite surprised uh, when they asked the question uh, at one of those first meetings uh, what do you people mean by democracy and we spouted out in no uncertain terms that we talk about government of the people by the people for the people they were quite taken aback by that uh, they were also quite surprised uh, many of them to find out that the reason why there was a turn to arms struggle was because every other avenue of protest had been closed down and consequently there had to be an arms struggle to produce you know the outcomes that we needed they were also i think very very surprised <laughs> to find that uh, there wasn't any sort of ethnic antagonism 
towards Afrikaners as such. And on one of those meetings, I intervened by speaking in Afrikaans because so many of them was pressing fears about the future of their language, what's going to happen in the future. And by way of assuring it had a future, I spoke in Afrikaans. Many were taken aback. Oh, they actually even speak Afrikaans. Right? <clears throat> and then there was other little things, uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions that they had. There was one occasion in which uh, the issue of uh, the use of language in schools, uh, etc., was raised. And uh, one had to explain, for example, that, look, uh, if you're talking about the teaching of mathematics, uh, are you interested in mathematical expertise or in the ethnic origin of the person? And you could almost visibly see a penny drop in the heads of some of them. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, it is better to have someone who, who's an expert in mathematics, even if it's not from your ethnic origin. And little things like that. So in a way, it was uh, perhaps sweeping away of cobwebs of ignorance, uh, which then makes it possible to have a dialogue. And I think for many of uh, the African intellectuals who participated in those discussions, it was uh, quite an eye opener. It also assisted them in understanding that the ANC and the liberation movement were not composed of people with horns and tails, were not devils, bloodthirsty bastards who wanted to maybe drive the white man into the sea or something like that. Uh, and that, I think, was quite significant in terms of opening up the minds of uh, people who had until then been the intellectual bastions of uh, the apartheid regime. These were scholars from universities like Stellenbosch, Potterstrom, Pretoria. These were legal experts <laughs> who worked for the regime in various capacities, etc. Uh, so it wasn't any small sort of breakthrough in that respect. May I add just one point to that? That one of the central features and common features of all the discussions with the white community was that they raised the question of the armed struggle by the, led by the ANC. And what was critical in those discussions is when we patiently explained the history of the movement, its commitment to finding a solution through dialogue, and the fact that it was the regime that forced us to turn to arms because it closed the door to all forms of bringing about change through protest. And that we were therefore not wedded to violence for violence sake. It, that the violence in our system emanated from the violence of the apartheid system. That we have resorted to the armed struggle because of those conditions. I think that discussion always ended up in a particular way. They would come there to first say, give up the armed struggle and we can talk about change. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, we will talk about giving up the armed struggle when we have really seriously engaged in change because the source of the violence is the apartheid system. And they, none of them had an answer to that problem to the way we explained our case. And I think it was a major problem for them to justify the maintenance of their system rather than to come to us and say, give up the armed struggle. So I think that was a crucial element in the discussions. And I, I think it made the apartheid system recognize, firstly, that all the efforts that it was making to win a section of the oppressed people as collaborators through the Bantustan schemes, through the local authorities, and through the House of De Representatives for the so-called Colors and the House of Delegates, the tricameral system. All of those searches to bribe and create a stratum of collaborators was not working. The masses of the people had reached a stage in their uprising where they were not prepared to engage with any of these collaborative institutions and we're not prepared to tolerate having people from our own ranks of the oppressed serve as collaborators. So they realized that that road was closed. And the second thing they realized that is that the armed struggle will not be abandoned unless and until 
there is a firm change towards change in favor of a democracy. And Mr. Maharaj, can you please talk to us about the ANC's preparation for negotiations and how was a consensus arrived at within the ANC to pursue those negotiations? We faced a situation also from our side where after the Gomati Accord, there were leaders in the frontline states of Africa, which were a major part of our support, who were then saying to us, man, there seems to be no way forward but to engage in negotiations with Pretoria. But it was President Tambo who turned, in particular to Comrade Palo, and said, Palo was involved in research and publicity and information and said, can you look at all the proposals that are being made inside the country in the White Committee and others, including the Butelezi Commission? What are these things? How serious are they? What are the chances of negotiation? And in preparing that report, Paolo, in 1985, early 86, said, look, if you want to be in control of the process, it is important that as the ANC, we should take out our positions so that others react to our views rather than we react to views coming from the regime and its supporters. And he proposed two ideas, a commitment to a multi-party democracy and a commitment to fundamental human rights. And he said, if we do that, we will change the scenario and people would have to react to our positions, and therefore we would be guiding the direction of change. Tambo asked a committee to look at the feasibility of negotiations, and that committee reported back to say the regime is not serious. But nonetheless, it is important that the ANC, as the leader of the democratic forces, should be looking at the issues of constitutions for the future and set up a constitutional committee headed by Professor Jack Simons. That committee was crucial to engaging with thinking about and looking at the experiences of our country and around the world and in the anti-colonial world, Africa and Asia as a whole, and look at their experiences and say, what do we think? And it is in that context that the national executive in a January the 8th statement committed the ANC to a multi-party democracy and to fundamental human rights in our constitution. The next thing was that through that process, the ANC issued those constitutional guidelines that I've talked about. And again, what was important, Tabi, to understand is that this was not just now an in-house discussion amongst like-minded people. We sought to draw in everybody in South Africa and we went to the anti-apartheid forces around the world, academics, professors, lecturers, and supporters of the struggle, and said, here are the guidelines, discuss it. Tell us what, are you, what is your thinking. And in that basis, we engaged with the OSATU, we engaged with the UDF, we engaged with the business sector, the NAFCOC, we engaged with the white community and the churches, not just within the established churches, but also across the board in the religious sector, in the interfaith community, to get their views. And we invited all sectors of the white community who were already involved in one form or another in supporting the liberation struggle. There was a pilgrimage taking place to Lusaka where all these forces and organizations engaged in discussing with us. And the culmination was, a conference called in December 19, uh, 1989 at Wits University, where all the mass organizations converged to discuss and in fact look at the principles of the Harare Declaration. So we created the unity of all the forces. And it is that unity of our forces that gave us the capacity to wrench control out of the National Party government into a democracy. And Mr. Jordan, what was the impact of the Nkomati Accord between the apartheid regime and the government of Mozambique on the ANC? Yes. Well, the Nkomati Accord came as a terrible disappointment to the ANC, as you might imagine. It came also as a terrible disappointment to the uh, 
frontline states and to the OAU. Uh, in terms of uh, the explanations the Mozambicans uh, gave to us, uh, they spoke in terms of a situation in which uh, they were between a rock and a very, very hard place. And uh, this was the only option that they could choose at that moment in time. Of course, we were not going to get into a situation where we would quarrel with Mozambique about that issue, uh, although we made our views very clear uh, on uh, the approach that they were taking. But we weren't going to go into conflict with Mozambique on that particular question because it was important to us to retain the diplomatic and other forms of support of the Mozambican government and Mozambican people. Uh, what the ANC then tried to do was to A, uh, mobilize the frontline states and the rest of the African continent uh, to maintain its position uh, with relation to the liberation struggle and its positions in relation to the apartheid regime. And then we also responded by demonstrating uh, in practice that it was not our reliance on countries like Mozambique, Swaziland, and Botswana that was in fact uh, making the struggle and the pace of the struggle uh, possible. It was the reconstruction of our movement inside the country that was making that possible. Because you'll notice that after Komati, you didn't have a decline or a downscaling or de-escalation of the struggle in fact, it escalated. And uh, that more than anything else demonstrated both to Mozambique and to the rest of the world that uh -uh, it's not reliance on external bases that is making the struggle in South Africa prosper. It is the strength of the liberation forces inside the country. I think that response uh, that the ANC was able to demonstrate uh, was far more important than anything you could have said to the Mozambique or to anyone else on the issue of Nkomati. I think in time also, Mozambique realized that uh, the regime was not dealing from the top of the deck when it met them at Nkomati. They continued to support the uh, subversives of uh, Renamo. The, the sabotage continued, uh, the assassinations continued. All that continued. And yeah, that was a very bitter lesson for Mozambique as well in that respect. But I think the important thing was that we were able to demonstrate both to Mozambique and to the African states that it was our internal strength and remobilization that was taking the struggle forward. And it was therefore important to maintain the line and not to given in the way that Mozambique had made concessions. At the same time, I would like to add one thing, is that disappointing as it was to have the decision by Mozambique to sign the Nkomati Accord, we need to understand and appreciate the pressures that the countries neighboring South Africa were undergoing from the apartheid regime. Mozambique had virtually been brought to its knees and we've had cases of raids, of economic pressure on all the neighboring states. And the sacrifices that were made by the people of the neighboring states were a very important element for us to recognize and to appreciate even now. So that the setbacks such as Gomati, we, we were able to deal with it because we understood that the Mozambicans had caved in, not because they had given up the idea of a democracy for South Africa, mm. but that they were under intense economic and political pressure and the support for the rebel movement opposing the Mozambican government that brought about that situation. So it was a disappointment for us. It was something that we understood, we appreciated, and we never allowed it to break up the unity of the African continent. It is something that we have jealously guarded in the struggle. It is something that our people jealously guarded. And it is something that we need to guard as we walk into the future.
And Mr. Maharaj, can you give us a flavor of how a breakthrough was achieved via the Khrushchev Minute? And what role did Nelson Mandela and the others play during the talks? I think the crucial element that led to the Khrushchev Minute is that the apartheid regime found itself in a position where it was now finding people who supported it and governments who supported it in the West, finding the pressure in their own countries such that they too had to find themselves condemning apartheid. Whatever their objectives were, the pressure that they were experiencing was forcing them in that direction. And what we have shown is the communication that Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister of Britain at the time of the Commonwealth talks at the Bahamas, wrote to him after the conference to say that she was doing her best to make sure that the ANC and the sanctions movement did not succeed. And that the effort to set up the eminent persons group was in effort to head off that sanctions. So that development was taking place. And, so, and therefore, the persistent message of the ANC and underpinned by the Halara Declaration that what needs to happen is a discussion about the change from apartheid to a democracy. So F.W. de Klerk, when he became the president of the country, looked at the situation and felt that if he did a wide sweeping unbanning of all the organizations and made the commitment to the release of political prisoners, etc., an issue that he was committed to, he would be able to control the situation. The Khrutskir talks took place three months later. The discussions that went on in those three months were still very difficult discussions to bring us to Khrutskir. Because even in those logistical discussions, the apartheid regime was trying to split the ANC and was insisting, for example, that you could not have the communist leader, Joe Slovo, as part of the ANC delegation. They were still trying now and then to bring up the question of violence. So Khrutas here took place against that background. And the meeting itself, its significance was that the apartheid regime had failed to impose those conditions and recognize that the discussions had to have as a central player the ANC. But there was still a long battle to go on because the shape of the table and who was to sit at the table was also a critical matter. And the ANC said, that everybody from the oppressed should be at the table. We actually said there should be an all-party conference. And it is those discussions coming after the Khrutskir minutes that led to the formation of and launch of CODESA, where every political organization that had come into existence and existed at that time had a seat at the table irrespective of its credentials. And the majority that sat at the table were organizations that had come into existence under the patronage largely of the apartheid system. So even there, we had to face a situation about ensuring that our faith in the oppressed coming together would triumph, even though there were forces that were spawned by the apartheid system. And again, that process necessitated the ANC to take the lead in creating the patriotic front of all the organizations to draw our people together and hold the, the line. I'm saying this because Khrutskir was now the beginning of negotiations becoming a terrain of struggle. And what happened at, at Khrutskir? was the beginning of the opening shots of negotiations as a struggle terrain. It was taking place, of course, in an atmosphere where we treated the other side with respect. But Mandela, in his opening remarks to that meeting, 
said something which Pete Botha has recorded, where in talking about the condition of the oppressed in South Africa, Mandela turned to the history of the Africana themselves and said that it remained a problem for him that the Africana who had risen and gone to war, guerrilla warfare, against British imperialism, themselves became oppressors. And Pit Botha confesses that when Mandela posed that question, how did this happen? He said he did not have an answer to that question. So Krutis here was marked by that there was a struggle going on at the table. And that struggle as understood by the ANC was not confined to the table. The ANC sought at all times to bring the people into the process. In the build up to the negotiations, was it always in the ANC's plans to replace the apartheid regime with the constitutional democracy, Mr. Jordan? Well, if you look at the history of the ANC from its inception, 1912, uh, that was always the thrust of ANC policy. During uh, the 90 to 94 period, in fact, we did publish a small pamphlet called the ANC and the Bill of Rights, in which we trace ANC constitutional thinking uh, from 1912 through what was called the African Bill of Rights, 1925, the African Claims, 1943, <coughs> the Freedom Charter and our constitutional guidelines to demonstrate that there was a continuing thread with respect to the ANC thinking. The continuous thread was the principle of government by the consent of the governed. That was central to the thinking of the ANC. Now, if you look at the 1925 Bill of Rights, for example, it speaks in terms of the old Cape franchise, that was the qualified franchise that Africans in the Cape enjoyed uh, until 1910. It wasn't an inclusive democracy in that respect, but still that principle of government by the consent of the government was central to that. African claims speaks in terms of inclusive democracy, which is one person, one vote. Freedom Charter takes that further. Now, constitutional guidelines we then tease that out even further and say that in right, proceeding from the principle of government by the consent of the governed, we have then to root this in a Bill of Rights which guarantees the citizen certain fundamental rights like the right of assembly, the right to a free press, a freedom of conscience, etc., etc. And that was the thinking of the ANC I would say quite consistently since 1912. Now, they might have been at various times and at various moments different interpretations of what government by the consent of the government means, especially in the, in the South African context. But I think there was that consistency in terms of the ANC's vision. And Mr. Maharaj, how could you respond to those who argue that the current and ongoing problems in the country are as a result of compromises made during the negotiated settlement? Let me begin by saying that in addition to the organic development of the view within South Africa led by the ANC that the change had to be based on a democracy and on the principle of one person, one vote. And that, that was amplified by saying that in that constitution, we commit ourselves to multi-party democracy and to fundamental human rights. This position was in line with the experience of the anti-colonial struggles around the world. And in particular, the position that was evolving in the Pan-African conferences. President Nkrumah, or after Ghana achieved its independence, who was a leading force of the Pan-African movement, said at the time that we must seek the political kingdom which would give us the instruments to change the nature of our society. But he said that should be the aim of the struggle. 
So that's the context in which we met. Now, we have stopped the book at 1990 Krutiskir. The issue at Krutiskir and the record is there in our books. There is no evidence whatsoever of any compromise that had been made up to 1990. The story that there is a compromise made relates to the period of 1990 to 1994, which is not the subject of our book. But nonetheless, because you've asked the question, let me put the issue in this way. It is important that we should discuss issues, even allegations of compromises, against the background of facts, rather than just speculation and taking the wisdom of hindsight and imposing it on the past. And when we look at that, I have in many instances challenged people to say, what do you mean by a compromise in that constitution? The major concession we made at the negotiating table about achieving majority rule was to agree that there would be a transition phase of a forced coalition government where every party that had achieved 5% or more of the vote would in proportion to its vote have a seat in the cabinet that would be a coalition government that would last for not more than five years. That coalition, actually the enforced coalition, came to an end in 1996 after the Constitutional Assembly adopted the new constitution and the final constitution. And the National Party under de Klerk walked out of the coalition government. So that was a critical element of the compromise. There was other elements, such as what is written in the interim constitution, what is called the sunset clauses, where we assured the existing civil service, not just in the white parliament and white civil service, but in the Bantustan civil service, guarantees that they would have job security for five years. And it's called sunset because it had an expiry date to it. So that's an example again of a compromise. There has been much debate recently about the question of land rights and the question whether the constitution allows us to appropriate land without compensation. The fact of the matter is that in the debate there has been much use of the word willing buyer, willing seller. And I hope people would read Nukai Tobi's recent book on land matters. And you will find that in our interim constitution and in the final constitution, the word willing buyer, willing seller does not appear. It is not in the constitution. There is space to take action in order to redress the past that is provided for in that constitution. So, without going into an exhaustive answer on your question, and because it is necessary to discuss those issues on the basis of facts, and on the basis of the understanding and the alignment of forces at that time when the constitution was written and adopted, we need to have that kind of discussion because at our book launch, we had five generations present at the launch. And what was interesting is that there were differences of views, but they were mainly because of the present condition of our country that was leading them to have an understanding of the past. But until we put the facts on the table, we cannot have a proper engagement and discussion so that we unite across generations to move our country forward, so that we understand what are the instruments that are available to us in our constitution to reshape the socio-economic arrangement of our society, which still remains largely imprinted by the apartheid colonial system. So those are challenges, and I think we need to address the compromises that were made, 
in that context and based on facts, because that is when you can really get a meeting of minds. And even with the differences at the table, we come out with an enriched view, which takes into account the experiences of the people in the different areas that they are in, find themselves in, so that we move together as a country. Change needs to be taken forward as a permanent issue, and it needs to be solidified and sustainable by having the people support it. And Mr. Jordan, what can you say adding to that? No, I wouldn't yeah. say that there were compromises made. The outcomes that the negotiations produced, I think, should determine how we look at that. We arrived with the skill to discuss with the National Party that comes with the delegation that is all male, all white. Contrast that with the ANC's delegation, <laughs> which is multi-gender, multi-racial, multilingual, multi-faith as well. That in itself, those were statements in and of themselves. The NP comes to those discussions with a program which speaks in terms of group rights, the idea of some sort of consociational arrangement in which uh, uh, the whites would have the power to veto initiatives that they didn't approve of. The ANC comes to those discussions with the program speaking in terms of individual rights. The outcome of all those discussions the interim constitution and then the final constitution. Outcome is not the NP's design, it is the ANC's design. You look also, as we go to Cadessa, one can speak in terms of uh, perhaps four major forces that participated in Cadessa. There is the liberation movement, there is a party like the IFP, there is the then Democratic Party, which moved into the DA, and the NP. All three of these, the NP, the DP, and the IFP, are speaking in terms of some sort of consociational arrangement in which either ethnic entities or racial groups will have veto power over initiatives that they don't like. They're all speaking in terms of group rights, in the case of uh, the NP and the DP, uh, the notion was to use this as a means of thwarting the aspirations of the oppressed majority. In the case of the IFP, uh, the idea was, uh, uh, I suppose, an ethnic group uh, that was dominant in KwaZulu Natal having some sort of veto over initiatives that they did not like. The outcome is not that. The outcome, in fact, is what the liberation movements want, which is individual rights based on universal franchise. So when you look at it in those terms, the people who compromised were the other side, not the liberation movements. The, the book that we have produced, we hope Breakthrough will become part of the discussion by everyone in our country, particularly the younger generation. It has meticulously sought to put the facts that are available. We have tried to avoid putting anything that is based on a thumbsuck of an event or a fact. And if we have left out any facts, it should be brought into the debate because it is on the basis of those facts that we are able to engage and come to a common understanding of where we come from. It is crucial that we should engage in that exercise because with the problems that we are confronted with and the enormous challenges that we are facing today in our country, it is important that we should understand that part of being a force for change is an understanding that builds our sense of self-esteem. Part of the apartheid colonial deny system was to deny us a history.
to deny us a sense of pride in ourselves, a sense that we are able to shape our destiny. And when we invoke our past, it is part of that process of building our self-esteem and confidence that we can shape the world. So the past is very important and we hope that the book contributes to that kind of discussion. And we are ready to listen to anybody who comes with a contrary viewpoint and adds facts or challenges us and says, no, 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 you are wrong. The facts are different. The creation of democracy in South Africa is not something that came from the skies or as a miracle. It is the outcome of struggle. And it is the outcome of struggle, struggle waged by the oppressed people of this country. And it is their achievement. Democracy in South Africa is the achievement of the oppressed people, the formerly oppressed people of this country. And as such, it is incumbent upon us to defend it and to uphold it. The achievements in our constitution, the rights our people have, were earned and were paid for in their blood. We must never forget that. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us in the first instance to be the principal defenders of this democracy and its institutions and the constitution that that struggle produced. That was Mark Maharajan Pala Jordan speaking to Krima Media's quality about breakthrough.